it's funny you said the head coach because when I was an assistant, I was never wrong. Right? You're never wrong when you're the assistant. You just throw the suggestion out there. Yeah, if he would have done that, we would have definitely won that game. Um, <laughs> that's what you tell yourself on the drive home. But uh, yeah, so it's much different. This is the L3 Leadership Podcast, episode number 141. What's up, everyone? And welcome to another episode of the L3 Leadership Podcast. My name is Doug Smith, and I'm the founder of L3 Leadership. We're a leadership development company devoted to helping you become the best leader that you can be. In this episode, you're going to get to hear a question and answer session with Andy Toole, the head coach of Robert Morris University's men's basketball team. Uh, if you missed it in episode 140, we published his talk from our leadership breakfast, which was phenomenal, where he shared his leadership journey and lessons he learned along the way. Um, but people asked some phenomenal questions. But before we jump into the q and if you're new to this podcast, we're committed to bring you three or four episodes every single month to help you grow your leadership skills. One will always be a talk from our leadership breakfast. One will be an interview that I do with a high level leader. And then once a month, you'll get a leadership lesson by me. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, I'd really appreciate if you would jump on iTunes or whatever you're listening to this on and leave a rating and review and subscribe. It really does make a difference. I want to thank our sponsor, Henny Jewelers. Henny Jewelers are a family-owned jeweler in the city of Pittsburgh, owned by my friend and mentor, John Henny. My wife, Laura, and I got our engagement and wedding rings through Henny Jewelers and had an incredible experience. What we love about them is they not only have great jewelry, but they also invest in people. John gave Laura and I a book to help us prepare for our marriage, and he's been investing in us as a couple and me as a leader and a husband and a father ever since, and I'm so appreciative of that. So if you're in need of a good jeweler, check out hennyjewelers.com. I want to thank our other sponsor, Alex Tulandon with Keller Williams Realty. Alex is a full-time realtor with Keller Williams Realty, whose team is committed to providing clients with high effective premier real estate experiences throughout the greater Pittsburgh region. Alex is a member and supporter of L3 Leadership, and he'd love the opportunity to connect with you. If you're looking in the market for a house, you can find out more at pittsburghpropertyshowcase.com. Let's dive right into the content. As I mentioned earlier, we had the honor and privilege of having Coach Andy Toll, the head coach of Robert Morris University's men's basketball team, speak to us at a breakfast. And this specific episode and what you're about to hear is our question and answer session with Coach Toll. And it was phenomenal. A little bit about Coach Toll, if you don't have much context for him. He attended and played at Penn, taking his team to two NCAA tournament appearances. He was the youngest coach in Division One sports at 29 years old. He's taken Robert Morris to the NCAA tournaments several times. He's beat Kentucky in round one of the NIT tournament. He's also played against Duke and Coach K in the NCAA tournament and so much more. Again, you can hear more about his journey in episode number 140. Uh, Here's just a few of the questions that were asked of Andy during the breakfast. How do you deal with criticism that comes from being a coach? How do you maintain a sense of identity regardless of whether or not you win a championship? Who are the coaches that have shaped you? What was it like to coach against Duke in Kentucky? What are your go-to resources that keep you motivated? Um, What do you do when you have people who don't want it as bad as you do? How do you motivate them? How do you discern good and bad advice when you're a coach? Uh, What's the difference between being an assistant and a coach? And what advice do you have for people in assistant roles? And how do you help people recognize the difference between success and significance? Those are the questions you're about to hear. Enjoy the time with Andy, and I'll be back at the end with a few announcements. Hi, I'm Dan. I'm an artist, and I was just curious, how do you handle the pressure that comes with people praising you and criticizing you, and how do you handle that pressure to succeed? Uh, it's, it's, it's really tough, especially in the uh, social media world. Um, in fact, I was watching games yesterday, and I put out a tweet about something, and I got like five death tweets back. Um, <laughs> LAUGHTER You know, it's, it's, uh, it's funny, but I think, I think the best thing to try and do is, is ignore it. Right? I mean, that's, that's all you can do. You can't, you know it's there, you know it's going to happen, um, but you, you can't buy into it. You know? And again, it goes back to some of the process and the daily routine of doing what you're capable of each and every day and trying to maximize that. And then what somebody says who shows up one game a year or what somebody says who you know, sees one quote in the paper, that stuff doesn't apply because they're not you know, invested in it. Uh, but it, it's really difficult, and I think it's really difficult for our guys. You know, we, we talk a ton about the social media aspect of stuff, uh, and they're so much more in tune to it. Uh, you know, we've, we've had to police some guys before who, you know, starting to get, you know, people criticizing them on Twitter, and they get into a Twitter battle, and it's hard. Um, but again, I think just trying to ignore it as much as you can, I think, is the, is the best way to handle it.
Hey, uh, I really appreciate what you had to say. Um, as a young leader, that's awesome. Uh, you talked about reclaiming your identity. You feel like you kind of lost that. Um, I had a question. If Even if you never win another championship, but you reclaim your identity, so say you, you don't have those stars on the team that you had year three that took you to the championship, but you have your identity and your team, you feel good about winning, and they go back and celebrate the wins, would you feel successful and why? Oh, a thousand percent. Um, I don't know if my bosses would view me as successful, but uh, but that but but again, that's some of what we were looking to reclaim this year. And um, you know, our record wasn't what we wanted it to be. We didn't win a championship this year, but we were so much more successful as a, as a team and as a program than we had been in in, in, the, in the year we did win a championship. It's crazy. Um, and I think we had two seniors that were on that championship team that, that are graduating this year, and, and both of them on their senior night um, gave a speech to our team in the pregame that, you know, we have our senior night festivities, but we let them do the pregame talk. And they spoke about that, about how they hadn't had more fun with a group of guys, how they hadn't enjoyed a season as much. And their goal was still to go and win. You know, at the end of the, the speech, they said, well, we got a lot more games to win. And, um, but I think right there, that was validation for me that we're doing things the right way. Do we want to win a championship? Absolutely. Right? Are we going to work like crazy to get there? There's no doubt. You know, we've just got to make sure we're finding the right people from a talent and from a character perspective that are going to help us do that. Because right? I think you can have success in both realms. It's not mutually exclusive. Coach, thanks. Thanks, Coach. This has been great. Um, Two-part question, if you don't mind. Number one, who are some of the coaches that you looked up to, whether it's now or as you were playing, um, as you were an assistant? Who are some of the coaches that you've studied and looked up to? Um. Millions of every coach I ever had, I, I think I studied and, and took stuff from positively or negatively, going back to when I was you know eight, nine, ten years old. Um, there's still there's still times where you know we'll maybe be in a rut, and I'll think about you know some drill we did on a nine year old travel team that all of a sudden you know might apply to this situation. So so a ton of them. Uh, my high school coach, huge influence on me uh, in just the way that he prepared, and I didn't and I didn't have. You know, I had, a, I had a, a, a typical high school career until my senior year when I, when I kind of had a really good year. So, so it wasn't like I had a, a you know, four-year varsity starter or any of that kind of stuff. Um, but now that I look back, you know, I learned a ton from him. Uh, Fran Dunphy, who I played for at, at the University of Pennsylvania, is a guy that I, I talk to uh, often, you know, and just try and bounce ideas off of. Uh, Mike Rice, who I worked for here at, at Robert Morris, is a guy, um, you know, who, who I, I constantly am in communication with and, and getting feedback from. You know, and then you look and, and you study, obviously, some of the most successful coaches, not just in basketball. Um, I try and read a lot of, you know, whether it's, you know, biographies or, or informational stuff on Belichick and Bill Walsh from the San Francisco 49ers, um, guys that are outside of, you know, just basketball and see how they handle their teams and how they handle situations and try and find all the points that apply and then kind of gather all that stuff uh, as best we can. Thanks. That's awesome. The, uh, and then the second part of my question was, what was it like um, going into those those two games, or the, the two games against Kentucky and the game against Duke, uh, what was it like, you know, the night before preparing for that and, you know, the, you're going up against coaches that I'm sure you've studied and that's Yeah, I thing. think you, um, you, you, you try not to, as best you can, make it at all about you, right? And I tell our team this all the time um, because as a coach or a player, you feel the pressure, you feel the anxiety, you have – you know, those emotions that, that are, make it difficult to think straight. Um, when those things arise, I try and pour myself back into the team, okay, and think about, again, what are my responsibilities here? Making sure that I'm substituting right, making sure that I'm, you know, making the right offensive or defensive play call, making sure that I'm uh, worrying about the game instead of worrying about who's down on that sideline. And I don't necessarily coach against other coaches. I coach against other teams. And obviously, Cal and Coach K are, are legends in the game. Um, but I think if you worry about what you can control, and that's your team, 
you're going to have a much better chance. As soon as you start allowing those outside distractions to come in or you start thinking about, oh, if I run this great play, Cal's going to think I'm a good coach. He don't care if I'm a good coach or not. He's trying to kick my butt just like I'm trying to kick his, right? And so that's what I try and remind myself and remember. It's not always easy, right, because there, there's, you know, you, you get put in, you know, the 7 o'clock game on Friday night on CBS, uh, against Coach K and Julia Okafor, who's going to be the number one pick in the draft, and you know all these pros, and um, you're trying to make sure that your team is is focused and need to worry about what they're doing. Uh, it's it's a challenge, but um, I think it's the only again the only way that I've found you can kind of balance you know all those other emotions and all those other things that are going on inside of you is just dump it back into the team. And I tell our guys the same thing: you're nervous, just worry about what your responsibility is. The ball gets passed, jump to the ball. Right? We call a play. What's your cut? Where are you supposed to be on the court? Right? I tell them when they first go on the court in some of those big games, I said, take a second, look around, take a deep breath, smile, enjoy it, because you know what? Like, not a lot of people are going to get to say they've been in these kind of environments and had these kind of experiences. But then after that, just think about what you're doing, right? That normal routine that you're used to. And then all of a sudden, you can kind of settle down and play the way that you're, you're, you're supposed to. Hi. How are you? Uh, so what are your go-to resources for your thoughts of the day and kind of motivational support? Uh, Twitter, uh, number one, you know, and I just, I follow a bunch of the, um, you know, motivational, you know, quotes, uh, coaches, you know, and I just kind of scroll through those things. Uh, a lot of times I'll think about maybe where our team is or where I am and I'll Google, you know, something, a, a quote pertaining to perseverance or we had a we had a really great win, a quote pertaining to staying humble or, you know, different things like that. Uh, do a number of TED Talks. Um, there's an entrepreneur out of New York City. His name is Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk, who I follow on Instagram. He's a little more um, in your face and, um, you know, can be a little bit crude at times, but kind of hits you with a reality check, you know, he, and, and those are some of the things that, you know, when I'm feeling sorry for myself because we lost a couple games, you know, all of a sudden you throw on one of his, you know, daily V's and he says like, no one cares. No one's feeling sorry for you. Get up, get back to work, figure it out, fix it. Like you're, you, you know, then those are some of the things I think you need to hear because that's the message I need to portray to my team. Right. And so, um, and then I have a, a, a decent network of, some coaches and friends who, you know, if they see stuff that they like or whatever they send to me, I'll save it in my email. I have a motivational folder in my email that I have a bunch of stuff that I'll go through um, and just try and figure out what might be applicable to the moment. Hi, uh, I'm Jess Paterchak. I'm a sophomore broadcasting student at Point Park. Um, so you touched a lot on your career, both being a player and an assistant coach and head coach. Um, and how you've evolved on and off the court. Now, for the players that may not have been fully as dedicated as you are in regards to winning and bettering yourself as a whole, how do you get people that maybe weren't as dedicated as you to do that? Like, what were your strategies to get them to, you know, contribute on the level that maybe you have? Uh, it's, it's probably one of the most frustrating things that, that you find as a leader, and it's probably one of the reasons that I coach is because I was, you know, so passionate about the game. Um, and you want to stay around it. But you also understand whether it was when I was a player, I understood that not everybody, you know, um, wanted to win as badly or cared as much or whatever. And it's the same thing as a coach. Uh, and it's, it's frustrating because you, you try and identify people that you believe will care, uh, but not everybody will. And so you're, you, you, you constantly have to figure out ways to work with them or at times maybe work around them in order to get to your end goal. Um, and we've, we've, we've done it a, a number of different ways. I, I think, you know, for certain guys maybe that we knew were, were good players and we needed them, we would ask, you know, some guys in the locker room to try and, you know, grab them and, 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 and motivate them. And maybe uh, after you've done the, you know, the basics of sitting them in your office and explaining, you know, what you believe they can get out of this experience, that'll be beneficial and how you believe you can help them you know if that doesn't work maybe you try and implement the team you know sometimes we've t taken some guys and almost um, excluded them from the team you know okay hey you know this isn't a big deal to you we'll just do all this stuff over here and then all of a sudden maybe the basketball doesn't motivate them but being left out of the group does right and they don't want to feel like they're not 
one of the guys in the locker room who can be relied on. And so now, all of a sudden, they're more engaged for a, for a different reason. But, uh, I mean, everybody's got a different reason for why they're doing what they're doing. Sometimes as guys get older, you know, you have to sit with them and say, hey, listen, I get it. You, you, you don't really like basketball. But in order for us to continue to move forward, you'd like to get your education paid for. You'd like to be a part of the program. And, and those are some of the conversations that, that sometimes you have to have um, to try and get people as, in, as aligned as you possibly can, uh, even though it's not you know, always a straight line. My name's Tyler. I'm an artist. Uh, you're the head coach. Uh, you know, final judgment rests with you. How do you discern good advice from bad advice from the people around you? Really good question. Um, and, and yeah, and, it, and, it, and it's funny you said the head coach, because when I was an assistant, I was never wrong. <laughs> Right? You're never wrong when you're the assistant. You just throw the suggestion out there. You know, if he would have done that, we would have definitely won that game. Um, <laughs> that's what you tell yourself on the drive home. But, uh, yeah, so it's much different, right? And, you, and you're trying to, to sift through all that information. Um, and sometimes you're trying to sift through it in uh, pressure environments, right? During the course of a game, your, your assistants are saying to you, hey, we've got to do this, we've got to run this, you've got to get this guy in, blah, 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 blah. And you're trying to you know, figure out as best you can. Obviously, in the game environment, your own preparation is really critical. You know, um, what you're seeing on the floor, trusting. You know, I talked a little bit about having that crisis of confidence as a leader. Um, I didn't have that in the game part, right? Because I've had enough experience and enough um, success, I think, and enough confidence from in the game perspective to make good decisions and to know right from wrong. Some of the off-court program stuff is where you got to sift through a little more. Uh, and, I, and I think you got to trust yourself. I mean, I think that's really you know, as, as simple as it sounds. you got to trust yourself. And then when you make the decision, you can't sit back and say, oh, well, if we would have done this or we would have done that. You know, we got to kind of get everybody, you know, from my staff on the right page and then try and make that decision work as best as possible. And then if you don't see it working, that's where you go back to being able to understand it's not perfection. Hey, we're, we're beating our head against the wall and it's not happening. Now we got to change course and maybe try something different. And I think that that's something that gets respected. People that are always trying to do something different. Like after a lot of times after bad games uh, or, or bad performances, uh, and I'll sit with my staff, the meetings will take as long or as short as possible until we can kind of have some kind of solution. Like I can't go to bed until I figure out something that I'm going to be able to present to the team tomorrow or something we're going to be able to do that's different or better. Uh, and there's been very few occasions where we've sat there and after hours said, you know what, what we're doing is right. We don't need to change anything. We just need to get better at it. Usually there's always something that we can discover that will allow us to be a little more effective or have them a little bit uh, perform a little bit better. And then all of a sudden I feel like we've accomplished what we need to accomplish and we can kind of move on to the next thing. Can I you expand on that? So when you said at the beginning, I love that assistants are never wrong. Uh, and as an assistant sees to be like, oh, he would have done that. Most of the people in the room, some people are the, the head guy of the company, but the majority of us, we report to someone. What advice would you have for people who are reporting to someone? What did you learn when you jumped into a head coach role where now you're responsible for everything where you're an assistant and you get, <laughs> you get to say, oh, well, you would have done that? Well, it's funny. My, the first, my, my first boss that I worked for uh, was... Um, uh, at that time, in his mid 60s, he'd been a head coach for you know 15 years plus, and he had his way of doing stuff, and that was it, right? So we would go to staff meetings, and I, you know, young assistant, here we go, I'm going to change the world here, and I'm firing ideas at him. Nope, not how we do it. 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 Don't be discouraged by that. Come back with three more ideas, right? Come back with four more ideas. Keep going in there and giving ideas. He wouldn't take any of my ideas, right? So then what I would do before practice was I would grab three or four players and I would start to do some of the stuff that I thought would be helpful to us without him giving it his blessing, right? We had a, we had a pre-practice segment where I was able to, hey, you know, I think we should have guys work on this cut or this shot or this move or this whatever, uh, and I remember vividly, again, we talk about the small wins. Um, I went in there. We had been turning the ball over like crazy. I said, you know, our guys aren't tough. They can't get open, blah, blah, blah. We got to get them better. And he's like, no, we just, we just got to, you know, keep doing what we're doing. We got to stay the course. This. So I, I took eight guys and 
before practice, we started doing a passing drill where, you know, there were a bunch of rules to it and stuff. And he kind of came out and he kind of looked around and he didn't say anything to me. And I just kept doing it. I kept doing it. And then we started practice, didn't say anything about it. And then uh, two days later, it showed up on our practice plan. Right. So for me, that was like a giant win that he saw what we were doing. It was in the context of what we were doing, but it was a slight adjustment that I thought could help us. And he might not want to admit it, but it might have been a good idea. And so I do the same thing now as a head coach. Right. Someone will say, hey, put this guy in the game. Ah, he, he, he stinks. We're not putting him in the game. And then I walk down the bench and I come back and I'm like, hey, get in the game. Um, <laughs> Because sometimes you got to remove yourself a little bit from it, and you got to say, oh, yeah, that's actually probably a pretty good idea right now. Um, and then my, the second boss that I worked for was the exact opposite. He wanted 700 ideas. He would walk in my office and say, hey, uh, it's 10 o'clock. We have practice at 1. I need six new plays by 1 o'clock. And I loved it because now I was, like, going and trying to figure out different stuff that we could do to score against the defense we were going to play against or whatever it would be. Um, and he was... He was, if, if he didn't like your idea, he was vicious in, in his, his rejection of it, right? And so there were guys that I worked with on our staff. You know, there was a guy that we worked with, and, and um, I said to him, how come you never go in and ask anything? I asked one question, and that's all I needed. I asked one question, I got my head ripped off, I never asked a question again, right? I didn't, and that wasn't the way I looked at it. I looked at it as a, as, a, as a competitive battle to see if I could come up with something different or something better. The... Didn't matter how many times I walked in and said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Can you get out of here? And then I'd come back in 15 minutes later and see if I could slide something else in, right? And that just was kind of my, my personality, um, and, it, and it's been effective for me. And, that's, and, I, and I want my assistants to do that. You know, like I've had issues with some assistants at times who won't do that, right? I'm not right all the time. I'm not right 70% of the time. You guys have got to be able to come up with some stuff or at least – play the devil's advocate role so that we can get to the right answer. Uh, and that's something that, that I want, um, you know, with me. But you've got to make sure that you're, you got to make sure you're ready, right? You've got to make sure you're ready to, to get some feedback. You've got to make sure you're ready to, to maybe get a quick no and then stick to your guns. Um, and I think it's a valuable, valuable asset. We have time for one or two more. I'm Susan Jackson. I'm with Mass Mutual. And I'm curious to hear how the story kind of ended when you won the championship and some of the players chose to go off on their own road and go home. How did you handle the remaining players and, and with that situation? Um, we got lucky is what happened. We, we, we ended up being able to uh, corral everybody but the one kid who went to Philly. Uh, and the one kid who left to go to Philly, he was injured. So he, um, he didn't play in the game. And so it was, we, were, we were able to, number one, uh, tell him that he needed to be back in Pittsburgh the next day by 1 o'clock. And he, even though he was driving to Philly, he better be on a bus and be back on time. And then we were able to corral everybody else in the hotel. And we kind of explained to him how we were surprised that they wouldn't want to be together at that point in time and, and try and utilize it as a, um, as a, as a teaching moment. You know, about, hey, we'd like to win more of these championships. And if you do, this is probably how you'd like to behave, uh, is being together and, and enjoying the moment and celebrating with each other. Um, so we got, we got fortunate. But uh, it, it certainly was a smack in the face because I had never, I didn't even think that could be something you would consider, let alone uh, act out on. Hi, I'm Shantla, and my profession and passion is mentoring. So I'm always trying to get individuals, young ladies that I work with, to know the difference between significance and success. So how do you convey to your team, even though they may not be being successful with winning games, that they still need to contribute to six, being six, I'm sorry, significant to each other? Well, I think basketball, like all sports, is, is a great opportunity to teach to teach life lessons, right? I mean, it's life lessons. So, you know, we're, we're constantly in, in, in conversation with our guys. And, um, you know, the makeup of our team is a lot of first-generation college students, a lot of uh, inner-city, urban-area guys, um, a lot of single-family homes, right? And, and so we're, we're in, a, in a mold where we're really trying to explain how this can help later how, and uh, you know and and how they're in a in a position where they're extremely fortunate to be division one 
college basketball players and athletes. Uh, and it's something that we don't take lightly in any, in any way, shape, or form. Um, and obviously we do some of the basic community service stuff, which, which is great. But, you know, I think even deeper than that, you know, explaining how you are what your habits are, right? And so if you're going to constantly be, you know, late to class, uh, you're probably going to be late to work and you're not going to work for very long. Right. Uh, and that there's real world significance to how you are, you know, living your each and every day. Um, and we try and point that stuff out as much as as some of the basketball stuff, you know, and sometimes those things have to be delivered with, with a much softer um, delivery than, you know, maybe some of the basketball things. But I think they can be just as just as if not more impactful because, you know, it makes them think a little bit about, you know, them building towards, you know, the next level of their life, which is you know, uh, having a job, being a parent, having a family, you know, and being able to provide and be a productive human being. Um, and that's, you know, that's really our end goal. Obviously, we want to win as many games as we can. And, you know, we want to, you know, go to NCAA tournaments and, and have success. But, you know, the significance will be found in, you know, how guys are living their lives long after they left us. That's good. And last question I always ask our speakers are, how can everyone in this room support you Maybe how can we pray for you, or how can we support uh, Robert Morris? What can we do? I need a lot of prayers. I know that. Um, no, I mean, I, I think um, you know one of the things that 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 has we've tried to do in our last um, in my last decade at Robert Morris is just continue to uh, let people know about what a great university it is, right? And I think you know some people in Pittsburgh. Well, not even everyone in Pittsburgh knows you know some of the exciting things that we have going on at the university and. You know, just just continue to to speak well, or if you have an opportunity to to get out on our campus, or you have an opportunity to come to a game, just just come by. I mean, I think that right there in itself is, you know, all the support that we need, and you know, we'll continue to to work our hardest to, you know, get as many people in Western Pennsylvania, in Pittsburgh, you know, and now we've kind of expanded our our reach a little bit even further, where people are starting to understand what kind of university we are, and uh, just spread that word for us, and we'll be very thankful. And you, you guys just made a huge announcement that benefits you, right? We did, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're going to break ground this summer on a, a $50 million basketball arena on campus. Um, so 4,000-seat arena, and uh, we're, we're currently building a new student fitness and recreation facility on campus, which is in conjunction with the, with the arena. So, you know, lots of exciting things that are going on on campus, and, you know, that just goes along with, um, you know, over the last decade, our, our new business school we've built, our new communication school we built, our new nursing school we've built, and so the campus is is ever changing and evolving, and so it's an exciting place to to, to work and, and an exciting university to be associated with. So, uh, all good things as we move forward. Thank you so much. Can we give another hand? Uh, to well, hey everyone, thank you so much for listening to the Q and A session we had with Coach Andy Tool. You can find the questions and ways to connect with Coach Tool at l3leadership.org forward slash episode 141. Also, if you enjoyed his content, you can go back to episode number 140 and listen to his leadership talk. You could also go to episode 114 and listen to my one-on-one interview that I did with Coach Tool as well. A few announcements before we close out. I want to let you know that we recently introduced L3 Leadership Membership. That's right. For just $25 a month, you can get into all of our breakfast events for free. You'll get a free L3 Leadership t-shirt, access the joint one of our mastermind groups, access to our member-only site filled with extra content resources and courses to help your leadership go to the next level. If you want more information on becoming a member or you want to sign up, go to l3leadership.org forward slash membership. I want to thank our other sponsor, Bab Inc. They are an insurance broker, third-party administrator, and consulting firm in Pennsylvania and all across the country. And they have a, a huge passion for developing next-generation leaders. Um, and so that's they that's why they've partnered with us and they host our monthly leadership breakfast. And we just really appreciate them. And if your organization is in need of insurance, I encourage you to check them out. Go to babbins.com. That's B-A-B-B-I-N-S.com. And lastly, if you want to stay in touch with everything we're doing here at L3 Leadership, go to our website at l3leadership.org and sign up for our email list. And you'll also get a free copy of my ebook, Making the Most of Mentoring, which is my step-by-step process for getting meetings with leaders. Again, I want to encourage you if this podcast added value to your life, we'd really appreciate if you would subscribe and leave a rating and review. It really does make a difference. Thank you so much for being a listener. I know there's a ton of podcasts out there and we really, really don't take you for granted. So thank you. As always, I'd like to end with a quote. And this quote today, says this, do not pay too much attention to fame, power, or money, because someday you'll meet a person who cares for none of these things, and then you'll know how poor you are. Mm. 
That speaks to me all the time. Thanks so much for listening and being a part of L3 Leadership. Laura and I appreciate you so much, and we will talk to you next episode. (music) 